Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Okay, we'll call this September 20th, 2021 meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners to order. Mr. Lashley, I believe you have the invocation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, can we all bow our heads? Dear Lord, thank you so much for another wonderful day that you have created. Give us the guidance and the wisdom and the strength to do the business for the people of Alamance County. As we all know, all things are doable through you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, we have one public speaker listed, but it's not an agenda item. So recall, we don't have the Board of Elections on the agenda. Okay, so that'll be at the second session. No other speakers? Nobody calling in or we're, we're contacting any more, Tori? Okay. Um, let's see. No, so there'll be no commissioner responses. Uh, do we have a, a motion to approve the agenda? I believe Mr. Paisley. Yeah, yes, sir. I move that we modify the agenda uh, to add a 7.1, which is a proclamation for National Heritage Park. I make that as a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion's approved. Um, consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? I'll make that motion. Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Approved. Thank you. Okay. We have a 7.1 proclamation for, for the National Hispanic Heritage Month, Mr. Albright. Come here. Yes, thank you. Good evening. My name is Jim Albright. I live at 404 Southwest Maynard Road in Cary, North Carolina. I work with Alamance Citizens for a Drug Free Community, and we are proud to be sponsoring, along with Alamance Arts and Glen Raven, an event at Alamance Arts next uh, this coming Saturday. So I got a young lady um, who's going to pass out some information to you all. If you can go ahead and do that, please. All right, her name is Gladys, she goes to Cummings High School. And then we have a couple of students that are going to read the proclamation, and one will read it in English and one will read it in Spanish. And then Carlos Valera, who is with the school system, will kind of wrap things up. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, young lady. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Adana Rihanna. Um, I live in 24 Northridge Street, uh, 124 in Burlington, North Carolina, 27217. Um, I came to this proclamation for the National Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, each year, Americans observe National Hispanic Heritage Month from September 15th to October 15th by celebrating the histories, cultures, and contributions of the American residents whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And whereas this observation started in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Lyndon um, Johnson and expanded by President Ronald Reagan, 
1988 to cover a 30-day period starting on September 15th and ending on October 15th and was enacted into law on August 17th, 1988. And whereas the day of September 15th is significant because it is the anniversary of the independence of for the Latin American countries of Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. In addition, Mexico and Chile celebrate the Independence Days on September 16th and September 18th, respectively. Also, Columbus Day or Dia de la Raza, which is October 12th, falls within the 30 day period. And whereas 13.1% of the population of Alamance County, North Carolina, is Hispanic <coughs> origin, whereas the Alamance County Board of Commissioners heavily recognize and supports the theme of this year's National Hispanic Heritage Month, Esperanza, a celebration of Hispanic heritage and hope. And <coughs> therefore, to be resolved that the County, County, Alamance County Board of Commissioners do hereby proclaim the September 15 to October 15 National Hispanic Heritage Month and encourages its residents to, incur to recognize and celebrate the individuals who come to Alamance County from various Latin American <coughs> countries and its contributions they are making to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm choked. I'm sorry. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm Carlos Valera. I'm the uh, ESL newcomer specialist for ABSS. I'm working currently at Cabin's High School and Grandma High School. Uh, her name is Yadir, she's a newcomer. She doesn't speak English, I mean, she's in my class. She's gonna read something in Spanish and then I'll talk to you again. So her name is Yadir, but it's ninth grader. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. Cada año los norteamericanos observan el mes nacional de la herencia hispana del 15 de septiembre al 15 de octubre, celebrando las historias, culturas y contribuciones de los residentes del Norteamérica cuyos ancestros procedentes de España, del Caribe y de la América del Sur. La observación empezó en 1968 como mes de la herencia hispana declarada por el presidente Lyndon Johnson y fue expandido por el presidente Ronald Reagan en 1988 para cubrir un periodo de 30 días empezando el 15 de septiembre hasta el 15 de octubre. Fue aprobado como ley el 17 de agosto de 1988. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you all of you for the, for the opportunity. Uh, it is very meaningful to all of us. Thanks to James for the, uh, making the right connections. And uh, in the school system, I have to be careful with what I say because my boss is back there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he was going to be here, but nice to see him. The big boss. So, yeah, I'm a, the big, big <laughs> one. So uh, we're starting a new conference program for students like Jadira that are coming to our school system with no English whatsoever. And it's nice to see because I met Adan when he was in elementary school. He was going through the process of learning the language himself and his sister and now they are fluent. Uh, we have in our county, I'm going to talk about the school system, we have a very important number of Hispanic students. We have about 5,000 students, and um, all of them are served through the ESL program we have in place. Uh, pretty much in every single school, we have an ESL teacher. Some of schools, I mean, they share teachers, but that's their job, teaching those students to learn the language. And when I say to learn the language, is to learn the uh, academic language, mostly because right. the social language is very easy to pick up, but it doesn't help when it comes to academics. So the new program, the new commerce program we're doing is, to me, very, very important because those are the students who need it the most because they come in ninth grade and they 
have a race against time to get all the credit they need at the same time, learn the language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I appreciate, I mean, your, the opportunity and the students and the community, they make our place more diverse. They enrich our place with their culture, their work, and all the good things they bring in our to our community. I appreciate the time you gave us here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We appreciate your contribution to the community that's a Hispanic. Contribution. I'll just add one thing. We had an event on Cinco de Mayo, and um, uh, Commissioner Paisley was there, and he actually during. Mr. Carter was there also, um, but I uh, mentioned we need to do this in September to honor this month. So uh, we got the ball rolling because of uh, Chairman Paisley's idea. And um, so thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. And hey, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes. I'd like to make the motion that we adopt this resolution. We have a second. I second it. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Yeah, we definitely appreciate the contribution of the Hispanic community to our community. And uh, I can speak for my wife who's sitting in the front row right here. She taught at Hall River for a couple of years. Well, the last eight years she was teaching, I believe it was. And uh, she interacted with a, quite a few Hispanic youngsters and uh, loved it every minute of it. So thank you again. Okay. Uh, Alamance Burlington School System Strategic Plan Update. Dr. Benson. Thank you, Vice Chair Carter, Chair Paisley, and Commissioners. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you this evening. And actually, Carl, that's a perfect segue. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about a new strategic plan for our school system. And I, I think what you'll find is it is very student-centered uh, in supportive, inclusive uh, classrooms throughout the, throughout the system. So we started work on the strategic plan, new strategic plan, about eight months ago. And, and obviously, because of the pandemic, much of what we've had to do, we've had to do in a virtual environment. So we, we had a lot of focus groups uh, that were conducted via Zoom. We looked at a lot of the data and performance information about the, about the system. Uh, but we also put out a, a survey to the community that we had about 1,200 uh, participants respond. So I, I feel like we got a good picture of what folks were, were are looking for. And really appropriate, given that this past July was the 25th anniversary of the merger of the city of Burlington and Alamance County schools. And so we've had the strategic plan that we've been working on for some number of years. I think it's time to kind of reset a little bit and, and hopefully get, get prepared for the next um, the next 25 years. So with that, our, our, the, the title of this is really about refocusing our efforts. And I have a very specific example I want to share with you all because I feel like if we can really focus our efforts in specific areas, we can bring about significant improvement uh, in, our, in our schools, across all schools. Bruce is going to drive for me a little bit. So I'm, I want to share this data with you all. This, this is our on-time graduation rate. Uh, and um, this, the, the state started tracking this in 2006. This is the average for the school system uh, as a whole. And you can see uh, for last year, our, we had the highest on-time graduation rate that we've ever had, 87.3%. When the board uh, interviewed me some three and a half years ago, I told them during the interview that um, I, I saw no reason that our schools should not be at or above the state average for on-time graduation rate. And so uh, we made some changes uh, shortly after I got here. Um, Ms. Johnson uh, put together a cohort model. We, we put in uh, graduation coaches. Uh, we track student progress toward graduation. And I am just thrilled to say that that 87.3% uh, is just above the state average for this past year. And I feel like there are other areas that we could do that kind of, of targeted focus uh, in the next couple of years and bring about additional um, improvement. So it, it's really more than a strategic plan. It's really a, a strategic planning framework, a concept. Uh, and that concept is, is based upon a set of core values identified by the community. Those values support the vision and mission of the organization, where the vision is this future uh, state that we wish to be in. Mission is what we do every day to make that thing happen. 
uh, we have four broad goal areas as a part of the plan, but the board gets to fine tune our focus every two years by establishing biennial priorities. And that's, that's where the focus is and where it is I think that we can see uh, significant uh, improvement in identified uh, metrics. There are actually three separate documents in your packet this evening. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation, which is I'm going to I'm going to reference um, most directly. Uh, there's a one-page kind of summary of the plan, and then there is a more detailed presentation of the plan that includes uh, the board's biennial priorities, key performance indicators, what we see as the key strategies that will make get us some improvements in those metrics. So going to the framework itself. The vision, uh, each Alamance Burlington School System student is prepared for their future in an inclusive, supportive learning community, which is what I just shared with you all. And, and I think that that's really important, right, that we, we help our young people find their path. We don't figure out what the path is for them. We help them discover that path, and then we make sure they have the knowledge and skills to be successful when they leave us. And it would be my goal to have every graduate of our system be ready to go off to the world of work in a job that will provide for them and their family if they choose to do that, to be ready to enter a service of some of some type or to be prepared to be successful uh, in further education whether that's going on to the community college or college and, or university and I think we would be in a great place right if we could say all of those students that are graduating on time with us have one of those three options or more than one of those three options ready to go mission what do we do every day to make that happen we engage and empower every student to become knowledgeable, responsible community members, engage in that kids are, are, are making meaning for themselves in in the in the in the classroom. It's not just a, a kind of compliance. I'm going to do what I'm being asked to do because I want I'm, I want to get this letter grade. But they're, they're making meaning for themselves, and then giving giving them a knowledge and skill set that will help them be successful in whatever they want to do next, and and hopefully come back and contribute in our in our community. There are four uh, core values that were identified during the process. The first is, is equity, and I, I really want to focus on how we are defining each one of these areas. In terms of equity, is that we ensure excellence for all, regardless of what path you choose, whether it's a, a, a career credential and you're ready to go to work after um, high school or into service or on to further education, we're going to make sure that you've had an excellent experience across the board in our school system. I think community, uh, number two here, is, is one of the big things that we have going for us in um, Alamance Burlington, and that's that we work together in a safe, nurturing environment where everyone is valued and supported in every respect. So we have a lot of, of, of diverse diversity in our schools, a lot of diverse thinking. Bringing those together makes us, makes us stronger, and we just want to demonstrate that we value um, everyone in every respect. Integrity, we are transparent and honest in, in, in action. We do what we say we're going to do. I think what we've done with the uh, bond projects and managing uh, how, how those capital resources are, are uh, progressing in, in, in building our new facilities, upgrading our facilities, uh, the work working with, um, with local government and all of that information that's available on um, um, the uh, Alamance um, County uh, Capital Projects website is, is phenomenal. But I think it's a great example of putting everything out there that, that's going on in that particular area. And then excellence, we cultivate and challenge each individual to excel through a variety of opportunities and experiences. And, and that is also, I think, something unique to our school system. The, the, the various ways that you could be successful and make your way through our, our system are really in, incredible. So whether it's a career in technical education experience, uh, the, the early college, you want an IB program, you want to you focus on, on AP, you name it, right? We, we've got a way. If we do a good job of telling our story, we've got a, we've got a way for you to get where you want to be. And then we have four broad uh, goal areas, right? And um, and again, there's there's more information on these in your packet where the board has kind of fine-tuned the focus for the next two years. But in terms of learning that we facilitate knowledge and skill development, empowering individuals and communities using approved standards-based curriculum, right? I want to be very clear about that. We are using curriculum that's approved by the state board. We're using curriculum that is approved through um, the AP, whether it is IB. Uh, it, it, we, we have standards that we teach to, and we're making sure that our teachers understand those standards and that our students understand what they have to do to demonstrate mastery of those standards. 
workforce, recruit, develop, and retain a highly qualified workforce more representative of our student population. Uh, we have worked hard to uh, re reduce the turnover that we've seen in staff. Uh, like many organizations across the country, we are struggling right now with filling pretty much every category of position within the organization. So you can talk about bus drivers, cafeteria workers, uh, custodial staff, our, uh, our teachers, you, you, you name it, and we've got some work to, to do there. But I can say that over the last few years, we have reduced the, the, uh, the, the difference in terms of um, uh, teacher turnover across schools. When I got here, we had a school that was above 60% in uh, teacher turnover. And you imagine learning 60, losing more than 60% of your staff, or if you r are running a business, 60% of your employees uh, in a year, and what kind of challenges that uh, that creates. But uh, I have to say that we're in a, in a very different place today as a school system. Stewardship that we do a good job of managing the resources that are available to us, and that includes human, fiscal, and physical resources in an equitable, effective, and sustainable manner so that we um, are not, not coming to the commissioners with a, a $10 million increase in our operational uh, request. And that uh, part of that is, is looking internally at how we're utilizing our resources. We added a, a risk management program a couple of years ago and a staff member to do that, and we've recouped a significant amount of savings many times the, 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 the salary of the person who is heading up that, um, heading up that work. And then goal four, a communication, implement and maintain effective two-way systems of communication to inform the school system and stakeholders. So both ways, uh, we want to hear what people are thinking. At the same time, we want to make sure that folks are aware of the work that's going on in the system. Uh, I, I've had this conversation with a, n a number of you that sometimes I don't think we do as good a job of telling our story as perhaps we could be doing. And the board recently adopted a three-year communication plan that is, is going to put us on, a, I think, a positive path there. And I think if you've paid attention to uh, updates via social media as an example, we're, we're putting a lot, we're pushing a lot more information out there for the, for the public. Uh, we are going to overhaul our website. Um, the, our website is, is not device dependent. Uh, and so if you try to look at our website on a phone or a tablet, you get the same thing that you get on your, your desktop. And it's really hard to find information. We're, we're testing a template right now with one of our schools that we think will become the, 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 the new way of looking at and, and us put it, providing information via the web that is um, device dependent and it will it'll make a big difference, I think, in terms of access. So if you uh, layer those all together then, okay, we've got the core values, equity, community, integrity, excellence that, that are the, the supporting structure for the vision and mission, and then four broad goal areas, and I'm not going to go into the board's priorities. Um, the commissioners have those as a part of another attachment. I do want to take just a few minutes to talk about the importance of brand in the public, se uh, public sector. Um, we're at an interesting point, I think, as a as a school system having celebrated uh, 25 years since the since the merger uh, and we have a new strategic plan a new commitment to the community uh, we've delivered I think on some deliverables that that were really due uh, years ago and we're making progress in those those areas so I think it's time to also take a look at how we present ourselves to the to the community but not just to the community to anybody that's looking to come to to live here or do business here uh, what, it, what is it that is the story of our, our school system and what's our promise in terms of the quality ex experience that you can expect? So um, don't even have to use words, right? Okay, there, there are certain symbols out there that, that just that connect to people. They know what it is. They know what the company's about. They, have a, they get a sense of what the promise is going to, uh, to be delivered as a, as a part of that. Um, we have a little work to do there. So, you know, what is a brand? Uh, there are, are companies out there that are really good at, at doing this um, tangible, intangible presentation of who you are, right? Who we are as a school system to our community and, um, and beyond. Uh, and it incorporates lots of different aspects. And so uh, the strategic plan really is a foundational piece of it in terms of the story that we want to tell. But, but there's some refresh here, I think, that perhaps needs to occur. And I think this next slide probably, oh, sorry, one more. We'll get one more before we get to the next one that um, we'll get to. But uh, we've got a, a university here that does an exceptional job of telling their, their story, and that's Elon. I think there are things that we can learn about the way that they uh, have told their story, how they developed their new strategic plan, and, and incorporate that into uh, all of their communication efforts. And then the next one is the one that I was getting at. And so 
I took our, our logo and um, I took logos from a number of other um, of a number of other North Carolina uh, school systems. And the, the presentation is intentionally in black and white grayscale, so as we don't get accustomed to any colors. And oh, by the way, if it doesn't look in good in grayscale, it won't look good in color either. So uh, you look at uh, what some other school systems in North Carolina have done to kind of modernize their brand, their promise to their community. Uh, I've shared this with a few focus groups, and, and the kind of feedback I get that is it's, it's dated. Right, it it it, it doesn't it, it doesn't look modern. It doesn't have a promise, and so I, I wasn't here when it was developed. Okay, but the stars that go around the outside represent each one of our schools. So we opened a new virtual school this year. We're going to open a brand new high school in 2023. Seems somewhat inconsequential just to add two more stars to the ring and call it a day. So uh, we're going we're to look at this a little bit, and we're, we're going we're gonna to put some ideas together and get some uh, feedback from the, from the community as how we might better present ourselves as, as a modern, innovative, nurturing school system. So with that, I have one other thing that I'm, I offer for um, commissioners' consideration, what's in a name. <clears throat> One of the things that we have used uh, over the years is, is, is somewhat of a tagline, not exact, exactly, but the notion that, is <coughs> that we're proud to be public. We are a public school system, but it doesn't say that in our name, right? It's our name, of course, is Alamance Burlington School System. Now, it's interesting, I did a little, a little digging into the history of this. That name is actually legislated. Okay, it, it was part of the merger. It was agreed upon by the commissioners and city council, and there was legislation that that was uh, that was put into effect into Raleigh to to make that our our name. Uh, we'd like y'all just to think a little bit about the possibility of, of of instead of having school systems saying public schools. We're we're not there yet. Just something to think about. Uh, it would require the support of not only the school board, but also the commissioners and uh, Burlington uh, City Council, I think, based upon what I have seen with um, the documentation as to how that name came, up, came about in the first place. So just something to think about at this point. And with that, I'd be happy to try and respond to any questions that commissioners might have. Would that require a legislative action? Would it need to I believe so. support from our legislative delegation as well? We, I believe so. Dr. Benson, I had a couple Any questions. questions. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, questions relating to the mission and core values, which are crucial statements for any organization. Um, missions to engage and empower each student. I, I love the fact that there's a responsibility for community members, and we've gotten, and all the STEM, or the focus on STEM, we've really gotten away from civics teaching and mm -hmm. how important it is to be members of a of a community, yep. so I really, really like the fact that that's in there. So, so responsible members critical. of our community. Yes. Yes. Um, the word engage. You mentioned Elon, how great they are at telling their story. Part of Elon's story is engaged learning, not just at the undergrad level, but also at the graduate level. Mm -hmm. And Elon is very good in telling their story, partially because they're very specific about what engaged learning means. And is there is there any in this in the presentation to to teachers? Is there any meat on the bones on what engagement means because I, without that it can be very kind yeah, of so we're serious. using uh schlechty's model of engagement which okay. there are eight there are eight characteristics that make instruction engaging um, and so we're, we're using that framework with teachers so they it, we are able to define it and to be able to look for it in classrooms we have a new uh, learning walk observational tool that we can use and go into classrooms to look for elements that support this kind of instruction and it's been built into the professional development that we've done with teachers during the last three years with rolling out our, our mind teaching and learning um, framework and that is that broken down for all different levels it is that's I think that's powerful I think that's great yeah, we've used it elementary, middle, and uh, elementary, middle, and high, and um, it, it has generated some really powerful conversations among teachers across the system. Um, that's good. The other question relates to the core values. Um, I don't know, so we've got the, the equity piece, which includes an excellent a, a, an idea about excellence, but then excellence is also another core value. So is, is we ensure excellence for all, is that what 
what the system is providing to students, or is that what the system is ensuring students perform? It's what at? we're providing to students in terms okay. of the experience that they have. Um, it, 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 we want every student to be successful, but there's, there's, there's some sense of what the student has to do in order to be successful. We want to make sure that we're giving them uh, plenty of opportunities and resources that they need in order to be successful, but it would be difficult to say absolutely we're going to guarantee uh, that success for every student. But we can ensure that our response to you is is an excellent response in terms of, of the support we provide to you, whether it's you want to go to work right after uh, graduation, enter into service, or go on to further education. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments? I just have a comment. Um, prior to you getting here, Dr. Benson, when we started the rezoning thing, which was interesting we had talked about possibly changing the name to it and i'd asked the question why it wasn't just elements county instead of elements burlington because once you merge and you become i know you're about school system a system of schools why it wouldn't be elements graham or elements burlington or elements mebbit that kind of thing and i mean i'm just throwing it out there because if you're going to change it we're all under one big umbrella of education and you see a lot of other counties that just have their county, whatever they define that as. So it's just a thinking out loud. No, no I appreciate that, Ms. Thompson. I, I think the challenge for us here is that the the way the name of the system was uh, was established initially, and so there are clearly documents that were signed off on by the commissioners and by. Uh, city council and there was legislation to, yeah. to support it so it's a little bit more of a challenge in terms of what what the po what possibilities might there might be well difference good sometimes we need to get used to different <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe allow our students to make our logo mm -hmm. uh, give the students an opportunity so actually, that's a, that's a strategy that I've used in another system. <laughs> Did it work for you? Um, it, there were elements that came out from the student work, but that, that what ended up uh, being adopted by the system was really took pieces from multiple uh, samples that were put out there. The thing that's important during the process is to hear what resonates with folks about the images and then to try to build on that. And so if people say they see partnership and community in this logo, well, how, how do we build on that gotcha. element? Makes sense. Thank you. Mr. Paisley, any questions? No, sir, I can give you a little history. 25 years ago, I was on the first merger committee. And that first merger committee, uh, in fact, consisted of 50% Burlington City folks uh, and 50% Alamance County uh, personnel. At that time, there was a lot of um, the Burlington City system was ranked pretty high and the county system was not. Um, and that first merger committee recommended not merging for 10 years uh, and instead pull the county system up to the city system. That uh, first committee was disbanded. A new committee was appointed. And the first committee, by the way, we studied merge, merge systems all over the state of North Carolina and all over the United States. And it, it was a really deep study into that issue. Uh, the second committee looked at it for a very short period of time uh, and voted immediately to merge immediately. Uh, and so that's, that's what happened. Uh, and so the 10 year period of bringing the county up never happened. Um, and we've been fighting that battle as a full county ever since trying to bring all parts of the county up to uh, what the old Burlington City system used to be. Um, the old Burlington system used to be within the top three or four in the state year after year. Um, but it also had a larger supplement. It had a lot of cash going into it that the county system at the time did not have, uh, which made a tremendous difference in what the county system had been able to do. Um, Hopefully, we're trying to bring the, and continue, uh, still 25 years later, to bring the entire county up to what the entire county should be, so we can be in the top four or five in the entire state again. And Dr. Benson, we appreciate what you're doing, and this, uh, this 
steps that you've been able to make to bring this system as a whole up to one. Now, the, the naming of it was part of the uh, agreement between the city and the county. Uh, and Dr. Benson's exactly right. Uh, it was highly contested. Uh, there were all kinds of names that were suggested 25 years ago. Uh, and the resolution was to leave the elements both and recognizing both systems. Thank you, Mr. Pace. And we do intend to see all of our schools um, at or above the, the state average. We have more work to do there, there's no question. But I, I just to give you an example. Um, one of the high schools, when I got here, their on time graduation rate was 80%. This past year, it was 92%. So we're, we're going to continue to move along that path. And lots of other indicators as, as right. we get back to more normal um, teaching and learning. Thank you very much. Good okay. presentation. Thank you, Dr. Pitts. Thank you. Mr. Lozier de Vice Chair Carter, Commissioner Paisley, Commissioners, good evening. Um, first and foremost, as I always do, I want to really want to thank the staff at the Health Department, our volunteers, our National Guard, for the continued passion work that they do every day to deliver wonderful customer service in all our services, but also in our contact tracing, our case investigation, any everything and all things COVID. Um, so shout out to them for continuing to do such a wonderful job. Um, so, as of this morning, um, we reported 48 new cases. Um, on average, each week, we're seeing about 123 cases per day. So, over the last two weeks, we've pretty much hit a, a plateau. I know it's hard to see on this screen, but there's a little, little V-shaped blip on there. But if you average that out, it's right about 120 cases. Um, similar to that, I guess similarity where you can kind of see it a little bit in January where we hit our peak. We were at 140 cases per day at some of the highest. That same kind of plateau is starting to look like a very similar plateau. The state has seen a plateau for about two and a half and three weeks and even a little bit of a decrease um, as well as our surrounding counties. So I think as of right now, we'll continue to monitor each week. Uh, but hopefully we'll continue to hit that high point and just start going down from there. So I pray that that, that does continue. We're actively monitoring 1,145 active cases, 36 uh, Alamance County residents are in the hospital, and we've had 315 deaths. That's 16 additional deaths since I report um, since was reported to you back on the, the um, September 7th meeting. Um, the little graph on the right hand side there is just the age breakdown of cases that are coming in. 0 to 17 make up 20 in the month of August, or August excuse me make up 20% of the cases the only two months higher that than that were about 20.8% so not much higher were April and May of 2021 um, and then this year to date um, for this year this month to date from September 1 all the way up to the 20th today 0 to 17 makes up close to 30% or 29.7 point 29.74% of our cases coming in. So we've seen that number go up amongst our, our youth. Um, again, testament to the vaccines. When we look at our 65 and older population, they're down in nine and eight, per, eight percent, and they stayed pretty consistent there um, since since the robust vaccination. Is there any indication that this is going to be a cycle we'll go through as each, or as obviously there have been several other variants that have yeah. come up, but have not raised themselves to the level of the Delta variant, but are they going to be? It, it, it's hard to say, right? There's so many variables in there. Whether this thing become vary, you know, we have a different variant, and maybe the next, well, hopefully not the case, but hopefully maybe the next variant is less effective against the vaccine, so on and so far. So it's kind of hard to tell how that's going to occur. One thing that we could probably say with for certain things that we can control is let's say for argument's sake that we do cycle down, um, but what's coming up here pretty soon is our holidays, um, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, we know last year it contributed to a lot of case spread. Folks are gathering, so we can do that smartly, continue to do this smartly and help control the spread. So that's something we could probably control within our control to do so. 
Um, so we're currently in a high transmission rate. Um, our measures that we use, the uh, case rate over seven days per 100,000 uh, population, um, which is right at 532. Um, our, our percent positive is 11.2 percent. It's kind of looking at the percent positives. That's kind of maintained over the last two weeks as well, right in that 11.3, 11.4 range. So we haven't seen so much fluctuation there. So that kind of speaks testament to the, um, the plateau that we're seeing. This is the Cone Health uh, data that they, they update nightly on their website. Their ICU in use is currently at 91% system-wide, so this is all five hospitals of the Cone system. Um, they have 145 hospitalized COVID patients, 127 are unvaccinated, 18 are fully vaccinated, 33 ICU COVID patients, 32 are unvaccinated, one is fully vaccinated, 20 vented COVID patients, 20 are unvaccinated, and zero are fully vaccinated. All right, so the top graph here is our deaths since uh, January of this year. Um, one thing I do want to point out with this slide, so we've had 115 deaths since January 1st, is our long-term care facility deaths, that number 37. That hasn't changed since June. That, that has been, been consistent, knock on wood here. Even before that, we had one death in May and one death in April. Um, so that number in our long-term care facility, so again, the vaccination effort in our long-term care facilities do a wonderful job putting those preventive prevention measures in place to try to keep control COVID out of their facilities. And then our, our total deaths, the age breakdown, <coughs> zero to 17 is zero. 18 to 24, we've seen one death. 25 to 49, 17 deaths, 50 to 64, 39, and 65 and older, 259 deaths. Our current outbreaks, now this is the what's currently reported to the state as of September 14th. We have four nursing homes and residential facilities. That's one less than it was reported to you on September 7th. One correctional facility, and then our clusters, zero child care, and three K through 12 schools. On to our vaccination. So 55.8% uh, of our total population has received at least one dose. 47.9% has been have been fully vaccinated. We look we look at 12 and older, 65.1% have had at least one dose, 55%, almost 56% have been fully vaccinated. 18 and older, 67% one dose. 57.8% fully vaccinated, and 65 and older, 84.3 have had at least one dose, and 81% fully vaccinated. When we just look at our 12 age group from 12 to 17, um, 5,211 had vaccine, vac been vaccinated, and that's 38.5% um, of our population. I say that's just with one dose, that's not fully vaccinated. And then last, our, um, just our a little bit about our vaccination effort. We continue to take the show on the road when we can and, and, and participate in events. Um, we were out at the 9-11 event um, in Graham, the 5K race just a few weeks ago, a wonderful event. Um, we're working with ABSS to do the four events in the schools. On September 29th from 8.30 to 12, uh, we'll be at Graham High School. On the 6th of October, we'll be at Cummings High School from 9 to 12, and then we're currently working on two additional locations, dates, and times to be determined. Uh, boosters, you may have heard on the news that the advisory panel to the FDA met last week. Um, they took two votes. One vote was for complete boosters for all the population that have been vaccinated. That was voted down. They did a second vote um, looking at the data and made the decision for uh, 65 and older uh, to be considered for a booster and those at high risk. Um, their vote is non-binding. It does, um, the, you know, the FDA will be final decider on that, but the next step, what occurs, it'll go to the uh, ASIP and the CDC, which are scheduled to meet this Wednesday, I believe. They will look at that make any further recommendations, put further perimeters around it for the people that do the clinical work. Um, they'll either approve it, not approve it, um, and then everybody will make the final decision. So we're anticipating the 65 and older and then any, any other parameters that are gonna be set upon the, those at high risk. 
Um, and knowing the, the, that population, um, we do expect an increase in our vaccination efforts. So we are planning to do mobile mass, uh, mass mobile events, drive-through events, um, starting as soon as next week. So a lot of it's just getting the word from the uh, FDA and the clinical considerations, and we, we should have some drive-through events. But that way we can move four or 500 people uh, through the, to get vaccinated. We can't handle that volume right. at the health department, so. Are we getting any reports of people who want to be vaccinated and can't get the vaccine through the various outlets, uh, Walgreens, C CVS, doctor's offices? Yeah. So forth. Yeah, no, no reports, and we, we do. That's the that's what we're blessed with. We have a lot of a lot of providers out there with the vaccine, um, and folks able to vaccinate. But we also know this is a motivated population, so we do expect a little bit of a a, a bump in our vaccine effort. Um, the good news is, if it if it doesn't bump like we think, we can contract our operations and continue as business as usual. So we'll just have that plan in place to expand and contract if need be. And could you just uh, tell people where the Human Service Campus is? Yeah, so the Human Service Campus is, uh, for the vaccination effort is 1930 McKinney Street. 1913 McKinney Street. I'm sure I said that right. Mm -hmm. And then we continue to do appointments and walk-ins for the um, for vaccine. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Uh, I have some. Like I didn't want to jump in. I didn't want to jump in the middle. I didn't know if Mr. Paisley had some questions. I was going to let him go first since he's a Zoomer. Mr. Paisley, do you have any questions? I, one, want to say a sincere thank you. Um, I, as everybody knows at this point, this is my last day of quarantine, by the way. So, <laughs> and uh, the health director himself uh, gave me a test. Uh, it was very, very kind and uh, proficient. <laughs> Uh, and the entire health department has done just such a super job. Uh, they also referred me for the infusion. Uh, I had that out of uh, Cone Hospital out of Greensboro last week. Um, and um, you know, in fact, last, not this past weekend, but a weekend prior to that, so some time ago. Um, and Tony, I just want to say thanks to you guys. You're doing a super job. I would like to uh, recommend, and Bill, you may be getting into this. Maybe I'll stay out of it. Uh, I would encourage people to go to your website, uh, your Facebook page, and so forth. There's so much material there that uh, is not out in the public. You're not finding it in the news media, and so forth. But if you'll check with the health department, it is there. Uh, and they're being extremely helpful. And Bill, I think that's where you're headed. I'll, uh, I'll, leave, I'll turn it over to you, sir. I appreciate it, Chairman. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Tony and his, his staff uh, at the health department. Um, they, they actually, you know, you guys helped me out as well when I had an issue. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today is uh, this monoclonal antibody treatment that uh, I took it at uh, Moses Cone. And like Mr. Chair, I like uh, Paisley, Mr. Chairman Paisley, I um, got my. COVID test at your office as well and was quite surprised that I was positive. But inside, walking in your office, 19 hours later, I had the antibody treatment. And 24 hours later, I had no symptoms, zero, and had no symptoms for the balance of my quarantine. Uh, and I do want to you know, bring this up with you that I do believe that this treatment is keeping a lot of folks out of our hospitals and it's helping a lot of people. Now, uh, and, and to merge the two conversations about the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Uh, as we both know, unvaccinated people get breakthroughs too, and this antibody treatment helps them as well. Um, I think the last I saw from the, um, the Fusion Clinic in Greensboro is in nine days they had zero people that ended up in the hospital. That's amazing. Now, let's, let's merge the two conversations about vac being vaccinated and not being vaccinated. As we both know, there are people in our community who don't want to get a vaccination. That's their right. But let, that being said, if you should get COVID-19, this is a viable alternative that can keep you out of the hospital and boost your antibody levels in your, in your body. And I just think it's important that we bring that information to the public so everyone knows that if you get COVID, they, you do have options. 
in, in your path. You don't just have to be quarantined. There are things you can do to make yourself better and to give you a better outcome. That's where I'm coming from. I just want a better outcome. Regardless if you believe in vaccinations or not, this is a viable outcome if you get COVID and it will help you. I can honestly say that it helped me tremendously. I was amazed at the way I felt, the way I thought I was gonna feel and how, it, how everything turned out. So I'm a really big proponent of this treatment, regardless if you wanna get vaccinated or not. Uh, I firmly believe you probably should get vaccinated, looking at your numbers. Uh, it will keep you out of the hospital, it will keep you off that ventilator, and that keeping off that ventilator will keep you alive. So you make your own decisions, but I'm just telling you that those are the things out there for you. Um, that being said, I didn't want to jump across, but I just want glad that you had brought this to the public's attention and have it on your website just to get the information out to the public because it's super important. Yeah, and, and if I can, real, yes, you know, real quick. Um, so for the for the public, since we're communicating the public, there's uh, if you do get COVID and it, and you're positive and you're thinking about monoclonal antibodies, um, first and foremost, the the parameters are within the first 10 days of um, symptom onset. Um, you can't be in the hospital and you can't be on oxygen. And it's for 12 and older um, ag and greater than uh, 88 pounds. So there's some parameters behind it um, for folks to get. Um, it's, it's done by either an IV infusion or now they can do it subcutaneous or starting to do it subcutaneous, which is basically a shot um, not deep into the muscle, but right in that little fatty level there that slowly absorbs. Um, into the body so it's another option for that type of Where treatment I didn't get a shot yeah. Yeah. but uh, for folks they can do obviously work with your, your provider first and foremost but uh, the website's obviously an, an avenue for folks to find it you can also find covid.infusioncenter.org or there's an 800 number which is 877-332-6585 for folks to call can you repeat that again sure so the phone number is 877-332 Six five eight five, and the website is covid. dot infusion center. dot org. Repeat that number one more time. Eight seven seven three three two six five eight five. And uh, Mr. Director, I only have one other thing I want to talk to you about. Uh, that uh, it's been a, it's been pretty much on my, in my email box all weekend long. And this is concerning contact tracing for our students and the ABSS. Uh, I believe that um, we have a 14-day quarantine in our system right now. And I think that uh, I wanted you to um, address this point being the, uh, you know, we have a lot of things that are out there in social media that uh, lead people to believe that these things are viable, possible ways to get their kids back in school. And one of the things is what CDC has said with the five to seven days. If we, as we know, we have clusters and people are being quarantined at home. And uh, some parents seem to think that uh, maybe their uh, healthy kids are having to stay home just because. And they think that there is a way to get, a, get their child, or child a test. And, um, and if they're negative inside that five to seven days that the CDC has uh, talked about, that they could get their kids back in school. And I just wanted you to address that particular part of uh, the quarantine that's going on right now in our ABSS system. Yeah. So let me start with the, the guidance first that comes from the CDC um, and it filters down through NC the school toolkit, the NCD HHS toolkit. So the recommendation from the C CDC is still a 14 day quarantine. That's, that's still the recommendation from the CDC. Um, however, they also provide two options, what we call the 10-day quarantine. So folks, as long as they have not exhibited any type of symptoms, at 10 days can come out of quarantine. However, the remaining four days, they must strictly adhere to social distancing and mask wearing, strictly adhere to those two preventive functions. And then there's a second option for a seven-day quarantine where a, you have to test on day five and have a negative uh, PCR or antigen test. Um, however, again, seven additional days you have to strictly adhere um, to mask wearing and social distancing. Um, so that's, that's the, the CDC recommendations for the quarantine. It's still the 14 days. Um, I have endorsed the 14-day the quarantine um, here for the county um, primarily because of our data and what it looks like. And one thing I did forget to mention about the guidance, it also says 
at the local level depending on local conditions. Um, so I have endorsed or recommended the 14-day quarantine um, based on our local conditions. We're, we're still in a, a high spread. Um, the, the numbers that um, I mentioned today are, are the 532 per, per 100,000 over seven days and 11% positive. Um, we continue to maintain that. We know that 11 and younger um, still cannot be vaccinated. Our total fully vaccinated rate is still under 50% um, here in the county. So with the, with the high level, the, e the, the high level of, of virus that we have circulating around, um, the, the, the fact that we can't vaccinate our, our younger kids just as yet, um, and, our, and, our high, and, and the Delta virus being as contagious as it is, truly weighed in to that, that recommendation um, for that piece. I do, I will say, I mean, I think it's reasonable that once we can get down to substantial and moderate spread to revisit that. And my team and I, we, we look at the data daily and we talk about it every Monday on our, on our epilogical team Monday, uh, on Mondays. Um, we look at it, but I think once it gets down to a consistent, at least three weeks, holds to substantial spread or even moderate spread, that we can move those numbers down to a 10-day quarantine and, and move from there. So. Question? I'm good. Thank you, Tony. I do appreciate all your help. Thank you, Mr. Lassie, for that, that round of questioning. Um, uh, Director, the, you mentioned if we, if we come down in our trans, transmission mm -hmm. rates, what's the best way in the county to, for that to come down? Yeah, so, so using our, um, you're asking me the action modalities of, of I'm asking the, what people can do to bring that. Well, people, oh, absolutely, so thank you. Um, so get vaccinated if you can, first and foremost. So those 12 and older, you know, get vaccinated. Wear your masks, um, especially in, in the school setting. Universal masking was put in place, but if we wear it ardently, we can help prevent that spread. Social distance when we can. Um, and of course, um, you know, adhere to the isolation and the quarantine protocols. And doesn't the the seven day protocol, the seven day quarantine option that the CDC recommends come, or doesn't it uh, assume that the person is totally vaccinated? It does not. It does not. not so if okay. you're if you're vaccinated, right. you don't have to quarantine. You have to wear a mask until proven otherwise um, after day five of a test. But you don't have to quarantine if you are fully vaccinated. Is, is it possible to roll that into a policy for schools then? You lost the the, the roll it in. Uh, rephrase that for me. So I well, we were talking about if if the rates come down, mm -hmm. like we might you might have a policy that comes off with a 14 day requirement. Um, is there is there a difference in whether a student in in high school or middle school above 12 is vaccinated in terms of when they can come back to school? Under, if we assume that we come off with a 14 yeah. day requirement and go to some modified version. So, a difference between the high schoolers and the, the my understanding? Well, once we get whatever threshold yeah. that you would be, be okay. comfortable with, is there a difference in whether a student is vaccinated or not vaccinated and when they could come back to school after uh, being being in close contact with someone who's positive? So maybe I'm sorry, maybe another say. So if they're if they're vaccinated, right. they don't have to quarantine. So let's say for argument's sake that that um, we're able to vaccinate children. Um, in fact, the next the next um, recommendation, the data that was released, they're looking at from five to eleven. So that's what they'll be considering. They they the FDA in the next few months in October and November. So let's say for argument's sake we're able to vaccinate that age group and they're fully right. vaccinated then there's no need for them to quarantine if they're fully vaccinated. So maybe I didn't even understand the policy. So if, if I, as a student in high school who is in close proximity with someone who's in COVID in their class and that student is vaccinated, then that student does not have to quarantine. If, if, that, if that student is fully vaccinated, that student does not have to quarantine. Okay. Does, I, does the, I just want to clarify, does a student that you're talking about have to go get a, a COVID test to make sure that they're you know, so officially I, negative? So if they're fully vaccinated, the recommendation is they monitor for symptoms and get a test on day five. Day five. Yeah. Okay. And so that's, the, that's, an okay, yeah. so that's an important distinction that yeah. I didn't fully recognize yeah. until, I get, until and, just now. And let me bring up a second point to that why it's fresh in my head too. Right. So students, <coughs> when there's ad adherent mask wearing between students, both students that, that um, are wearing a mask, let's say one student is positive, both students were wearing a mask and they weren't didn't meet the close contact definition because they were both wearing a mask properly. 
they don't have to quarantine as well. Which rises the, I think, increases the importance of vaccinations at schools with these four high schools that we're talking about. So what are the other schools? How are you picking the other schools so you might? Yeah, so the, the first two, um, the first two we, we looked at, number one, availability, right, um, and staffing, but we also selected them because the so, social vulnerability acts a, uh, um, index, so they had higher social vulnerability scores. Um, so that's how those two are selected. Our others two, we're looking at um, Southern, Western, and I think there's one more, and I can't recall which one it is, as uh, the next two. So a lot of it's working with the schools, looking what they have availability-wise, making sure not for those that have construction problem, projects going on, we're not interrupting those, um, and then making sure they have adequate locations we can move students through. Okay, and there's been some talk about um, about parental consent, not parental consent. Is there a policy from the county about parental consent in schools? Yeah, so no, no policy from the county, and the school doesn't have a policy either. Um, so, um, working with the schools, best practice for the schools um, is to make sure that we're communicating to the parents what's taking place in the school so they're aware that their 16 or 17 year old or 12 to 17 year old is, is getting vaccinated. For their general count, for general, our, our general vaccination effort, if someone were to come on site at the health department, State law allows us from 16 and older for the COVID vi COVID-19 vaccines since they've been approved by Pfizer um, to vaccinate them without parental position as long as they have good decision making capacity. Um, however, I will say we always do our best effort to try to include the parents and get permission to have a conversation with the parents when we can to do so. And that's best practices for high, for high schools as well. For, for the going into the schools, the best practice is communicating with the parents so they know what's taking place for those. And do we know which version of vaccine we're giving at schools? It's, it's Pfizer. Pfizer. Yeah, Pfizer's the only one that's approved for um, 12 and 12, 12 and up. Okay. I just have one last question. Yes, I just brought up another idea. Um, contact tracing. Um, the contact tracing that we currently have, do we have, uh, I know that the school system was having some issues with uh, you know, uh, contact tracing taking up some uh, quite a bit of time of their um, nurses, and I was just wondering, does the does the county health department have their contact tracers who work along with the nurses in the schools? Yeah. So we have liaisons that work closely with with their schools, but we they're separated. One takes care of sick patients, and the other one contact traces. So or are they both yeah, so the schools are in the the boots on the ground contact tracing. They're the ones that see you know they're they're school nurses. They're mm -hmm. ones that are familiar with their schools that they represent. Um, so they're kind of in the weeds, boots on the ground for that piece. We serve as a conduit and a liaison to work with them. We definitely get involved when we have high risk folks um, with uh, with contact tracing that we need to watch and monitor. And and and, um, and so that's when we're kind of in it a little bit. We triage it a little bit, but for the most part, they're the boots on the ground doing that tracing investigation for us. Excellent, thank you. I'd just like to make a comment. Um, year before last when we were starting to go through all this um, we had a George Robinson our athletic director when I was still on the Board of Education and he was talking about how they were going to do that because we were voting on having athletics to start back up we weren't in a school that we were going to have athletics and I remember I had a really bad attitude um, how on the sideline the team would separate six feet and wear a mask when the ref would blow the whistle, they'd all run out there, spit, roll, whatever each other. Because, you know, I, I voted for sports. I'd have voted for pole vaulting because I knew kids mentally needed something because everything had been taken from them. And when I hear us talk about what you're talking about and what you're talking about and all this stuff, um, parents are pretty much, uh, some, most of them have adjusted about the mask. I mean, it's, it's, I'm sitting here, I got choked and I'm thinking, God, I hope they don't think I got anything. So I'm just putting it on, it's my brand new one. But um, I think the frustrating thing is, when I was at the school board meeting last week, was the fact that the 14 day, there was no remote services. And we all know remote services, for some little kid would be great, for a lot, it just wasn't. And it's just what it is, it's not picking on anything. But I know we've got, the school system's got a meeting tomorrow and I have a feeling it's about the remote services back up because 14 days is like another lifetime to kids that's just had a whole year out. They are just at their limit. You know, they really are. And um, I wasn't gonna comment on this but right now, but I will since I got you, Tony, because I had a North Carolina Child Fatality Task Force meeting this morning. 
it was full board and we had the DPI person to present about kids and how much RSV is going through kids, flu-like symptoms, that's the majority of their hospitalizations and one child sick is too many but we live in a world that has diseases and we battle them and battle them all the time. But the one thing I just want to say is, and I said this when I was on the Board of Education, that, and I'm not taking away from COVID because it's absolutely frightening my fellow board members. I mean, it is a real deal. But there have been more, more kids ages 15 to 17 who take their lives with suicide, even in comparison to COVID. And because of isolation and, and you know, depression and being at home, and most kids learn sitting beside somebody more than they learn on a laptop. And that's just life. And, and I just want to make sure that we think about stuff like that. And even like with um, firearms, um, the number of firearm deaths have tripled in non-Hispanic white children in 2020, and the rates were even higher in non-black, um, non-white, black, non-Hispanic black children. That's one too many, because we've had some really horrible cases here where young kids, itty bitty kids, have gotten a hold of a firearm that a parent or a guardian had left on the table not thinking. And lock your weapons up. I mean, I, don't, I want you to have your weapons, but lock them up when you got kids around you because things happen and you can never take that back. So as horrible as COVID is, and it is, it's the devil of the century, so to speak. There are other devils right along with that. So I think the frustration we've been hearing a lot of times in parents was, if I've got to be out, I'm going to be, my kid's going to be learning because that's what they're supposed to be doing. And no matter what that looks like, school system's got to, oh, it's like inventing the wheel all over again with education. But um, it's just, I think it's very frustrating when I watch the Emmys <laughs> and they're all half naked and then they got, <laughs> you know, no mask and they're all, oh, I love you, congratulations. And then I see a classroom with children's mask on their face. Force, force really the ticks me off the, the hypocrisy of that. But we've always had hypocrisy, that's nothing new. But I think the frustration is, it seems like, well, you gotta do this, but I don't. And that's, I don't think people have an issue with COVID. I think people have an issue with how we act with COVID. And, um, and I'm gonna always be on the side of the kid because kids have wear everything on their back. And um, when, they're, when they're not wanting to live, <laughs> we got to do something better. And uh, we hear the sheriff talk about juvenile crime, how, Kids are out in the streets doing this, but kids are at home doing this too. And no 15 or plus or younger child should think their life doesn't matter, no matter what. And that's us to us adults to be role models for that and do everything we can to make sure they are in school. And, um, and if, you know, it's every time we turn around, it's a different policy. We're, ch we're chasing a rabbit. That's what it feels like. And uh, I don't know what we're gonna do. We don't have COVID to hide behind one day for some of these politicians way up north. So um, that's it. I'm, I, I'm your favorite person. <laughs> yeah, I think you walk on water. We do but appreciate I'm everything. But I'm sick and you guys tired do. of thank you kids having to carry everything on their back. It just it's always been that way. Seems like the health department's done an amazing job. Beyond yep. several of us can address that personally. So yep. they have. Anything else? No, sir. Thank you, Tony. Right. Thank I you, bet Tony. you're glad I'm appreciate not your patient. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Good. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm here before you this evening to uh, request that the Commissioners consider implementing one of the capital projects that's included in our um, uh, capital plan. It has to do with replacing our HVAC system over at the Human Services Center. Uh, this is the Old County Hospital over off the of North Graham Hopedale Road. So. Uh, just this slide and the information in the packet also gives you some insight into what this project entails. This is a very uh, uh, detailed and comprehensive project to replace the HVAC system at the county hospital, Old County Hospital building. You can see it uh, replaces uh, rooftop units, air handlers, controls, duct work. It's a very uh, uh, complicated project and expensive one at that. It is included in the county's capital plan, uh, uh, 2122 capital plan. As we went through the process to get bids uh, for this project, we did solicit for responses on the county's website. And we did paid ads in the newspaper also. Um, so the low bid that you see before you this evening was from Superior Mechanical, $1,489,000. 
We did work with Edmondson Engineers. We have a uh, representative from Edmondson here with us tonight, Mr. Tucker, as well as Buddy Weitzel. Buddy, uh, our capital projects manager, was very much involved in this. This, pro this project's been planned and talked about for probably at least two years, would you say, uh, Buddy? We've known it's been needed, uh, but it's taken a while because of the scope of the project to adequately plan it out and then to make sure our capital plan would handle it. Um, tonight, there's two items on the commissioner's agenda. The first is awarding this bid. Because of the dollar amount of the bid, it does require that the board take action to award the bid uh, to Superior Mechanical. And a part of that would be to give the manager the authority to execute the documents that would be necessary to do that. Um, there's also another item on the agenda uh, that has to do with the funding. It's a budget amendment. I want to take the opportunity now to explain since these two are tied together. It's the bid and then uh, the funding. So uh, the, the next item on your agenda is uh, requesting $1,712,350 be budgeted for this project. 1489 is for the actual cost of the project as bid by uh, Superior Mechanical. That's for the project and the two alternates. We're also requesting that uh, you consider adding a 15% contingency, which is a little more than we normally add for a contingency for a project. That contingency amount is $223,350. Due to the scope of this project, this is a very large project replacing lots of equipment and getting into uh, the actual makeup of the building. We'll be in walls, we'll be in ceilings, we'll be at, uh, on the roof. Now we're, we're afraid that uh, it could go beyond what a normal 10% contingency could hold. The building's age also makes us think that it may be valuable to have a little more than a 10% contingency. And also we're concerned about the price of material escalation. We are here this evening uh, to get approval or to hopefully get approval for this project. Uh, if we don't, we are concerned that the price for this will continue to go up. So we do feel like there's an opportunity here uh, to take advantage of the prices that we have now and uh, avoid if they're going to go up. But we would avoid that by approving it tonight. The originally in the capital plan, funds for this project were proposed to be uh, done through an installment loan. Right. So we were going to cobble together a couple of projects. This one, a part of the Medicap project, and I believe it may have also been tied to the EMS-based project. Um, but we, we've negated the Medicap project. We still have funding budgeted in PAYGO this year of a million dollars that we would suggest to you instead of, we're not going to do the Medicap project, we would suggest to you that you could use the, those uh, capital reserves budgeted for Medicap on this project and then use unallocated county capital reserve. We talk a lot about the school system and the college. They have unallocated capital reserve in the capital plan. The county does too. We would suggest, uh, I believe you'll see on the next item, it's a little over $700,000, that we would suggest you could budget uh, from our unallocated capital reserve for the county's plan to do this project. I will say uh, we've reviewed the uh, parts of the project. We do believe this is ARP eligible, right? This is uh, uh, ventilation improvements in congregate settings, healthcare settings, or other key locations. We do believe you could use ARP funds to do that. We do not know if the commissioners were interested in doing that either this evening or at any time, but uh, it is, we believe the entire project would be very likely to be uh, in, in its entirety ARP eligible. However, it does need to be done. We have over 300 employees that work in this building between health and DSS. I think Buddy can attest to the condition of the current system and its controls. I don't know if you want to speak to anything about the project, Buddy. Well, the controls currently, a lot of the valves and stuff, you have to manually go in there and turn them on and off to control the heat and air to the units. Uh, Jess here, the HVAC tech for the maintenance department, he's been doing that for several years. And uh, he actually went through with uh, David and his staff to every unit in the building, DAB boxes and everything, they reviewed everything there is that needed to be fixed and take care of them, what controls, what we needed. It took them like six months to go through and yeah, review the building to get everything down. And then we had a couple of additional uh, requests by the health department since they're doing the COVID shots over there now to have an individual sun heating and air for the AV room where the vaccine vaccines are given in plus for the professional boardroom where they got their call center set up. So that was added on to the project after it's been out and that was done amendment and that was the two amendments on there for the extra cost to take care of that part of the project. 
so again, we do feel commissioners that this this could be ARP eligible. The commissioners may want to consider uh, consider that, but uh, we do have. Uh, capital dollars available to do this project. Also, I will say that, uh, you know, as commissioners recall, we went just went through a project there for the chiller that failed, uh, unplanned, wound up costing a significant amount of money more because we had to bring in a temp chiller. Uh, we actually had to shut the building down for a while. So, you know, our, our hope here is to be able to make these kind of repairs on a planned basis, ones that uh, we're not waiting for this equipment to fail, right? We're, we're getting ahead of that, replacing it uh, on our own timetable. It will be uh, something that Buddy and his folks and the folks from Superior will need to work with the health and DSS staff in the building because they'll be uh, doing it by zones. So they'll, they'll be working with the employees that work in the building to make sure we're as, uh, there's as little disruption as possible. So uh, between myself and Buddy and uh, Mr. Tucker, we'll try to answer any questions you have about the project. I think Andrew is going to speak to the next item, the budget amendment, but that's that's kind of the, the, the overview of the project. So if you have questions, we'll certainly try to answer them. Can I just ask something really quick? What was the temporary thing that you brought in over there? That was the chiller. And how much was that? The rental was basically one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for the four months, and the new chiller was one hundred and sixty-five something. So we bought a new chiller too. Yeah, we had to buy a new chiller to replace the one that was broke. So is that chiller that we just bought doesn't matter anymore after we put all this in there? Or is no, it part it, of no, that? that's part of it. That, you got to have the chiller for the air conditioning of the building. Okay. But that's not a part, but, of, this part of this project. Okay. We've, we've paid for that. We've on that. replacing the chiller at this time, these two days. Yeah. But then we had all the issues with it. Okay. And the two rooms you're talking about, yeah. are they like specifically because people want to be cooler or hotter? No. Or is it just another it part of the building? The health department wants control over the vaccine where they're given the vaccines, they need to keep it a little cooler. Also, when they have blood drives, they got gotcha. to keep it like at 68 degrees. If you turn, right now, it's just one unit that does the whole floor. So if you turn it down to 68, keep that, you're freezing everybody out. That's Sounds like office. a school. So, <laughs> Sounds just like in teachers. So they, they don't like that they're, they're adding two new units by the side. Of, so you have three different zones for that floor level. So you can have these special projects and stuff and control the temperature to those areas and not affect the workers and their offices and stuff from freezing them out and making them too hot. Is that those rooms always affiliated with stuff with the health department? Well, they're meeting, this yes. large meeting room, the A&B meeting room, conference room, that's where they're doing the COVID shots now. It's on the second floor. So it's we can't the bill the health department? those higher bills and those two no they probably if i'm not speaking out of turn here tony but i think it's uh it's what the, it's on the second floor right at the building we're talking about the well, where the vaccinations are okay yeah so that's where they give all the vaccines and where all the nurses and stuff work is this going to give us better capacity to cut off zones that aren't in use uh you'll be able direct to it. go online and whatever zone you can control the temps from your computer, adjust the valves, open and close them, or set the temperature up or down for each area that you got. And that's a model we've moved a number of our county buildings to where maintenance now has to, if there's a problem with heating or cooling a part of the building, maintenance has to go to the building, uh, find the controls and manually close or open the valves. Whereas with the new controls and the new equipment, uh, much like uh, parts of this building, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, if, uh, if there's a heating or cooling issue, someone wants to change it, they're able to do that electronically. It doesn't take somebody to come over here with a wrench and actually open a valve from a, from a chiller, which is, I think, pretty close to what's happening now at uh, HSC. Yes. And I just have one more question. You're talking about this 1700 whatever. Is that going to be like a loan? No, we originally, the, the original capital plan called for it to be an installment loan, and the capital plan has capacity to make the debt payments on that loan. But uh, considering that uh, we have capital reserves available, what we're suggesting this evening is you don't need to take out a loan to do it. We have enough capital reserve cash to pay for it. Again, the commissioners could consider ARP funding for this uh, because of the nature of the work and the location. That's a consideration too, and then you, you keep your capital dollars in your capital plan. But the, we just feel like the loan, the loan is still an option, but if you've got the cash in hand, uh, it's better to go ahead and do but, it for the capital reserve. But if you have the cash that you don't really think you, you plan to have, like the ARP money, you would want to use that. Uh, I would 
Don't that would be my preference to use the art money first. Oh, we have two votes before okay. I got one vote to approve the mm -hmm. the contract, and then another one to figure out how to pay for it. That would be the first my... vote we're looking at. If I understand correctly, Mr. Haygood, is that we are going to be looking at voting on whether or not we want to accept this bid. That's get correct. This job done while we can get it at this price. Yes, sir. The, the first vote would be to award the bid to Superior Mechanical and to give the manager the authority to um, execute the paperwork that that would take. That's that's the item Mr. number one. Mr. Vice Chair, I have a question related to that. Okay, Mr. Paisley. Okay, we have a hard number, one million four hundred eighty-nine thousand dollars, with uh, this particular contractor. My question is. What does that not include? Why do we need a 15% contingency over that with our second vote? Well, I think, speak for Buddy, if, if you want to jump in on that. Uh, when they get in there <coughs> to start changing out some of these air handle units and stuff, you've got to cut the water off from the chill water lines and hot water lines, and the valves of those may fail. We might have to go and replace valves and stuff. They're old. They don't know if they're going to hold or not until you get in there and actually start turning stuff off. Uh, that could run up if, if you have to do that for every unit and PAV box that you're replacing, you're going to run into a significant cost of adding extra valves and replacing the valves to just shut the water off so you can be able to do the work, change out the <coughs> units and uh, boxes and put the actual valves and stuff on for the control. Of course, the hope is we will not need this uh, contingency and it will revert back to uh, capital reserve or if the commissioners want to do this with ARP and you don't need the contingency it goes back into the, uh, the ARP funding so we, we're, we hope we do not need it I know in the past when we've gone into especially our older buildings which I think HSC is a 1950s construction you know you, you run into asbestos or all kinds of other things that you may not have planned for that comes up uh, uh, during the during the project so we hope we hope we will not need it one more thing when well, they've been looking at this for six months why has that not been determined previously? I think some of the things, as Buddy mentioned, they will not know, like some of the valves, if the valves fail once they start installing the new system, they may not know that until they're uh, into the system. So, And there's no way to determine that in advance? Well, if you do, you're taking the chance of them not working, you're having to shut down the system to try to replace them before you start doing the work. And I think some some of these potential problems may not become apparent until the work begins, or until some of these new new things are installed. So uh, again, if uh, uh, we, we certainly hope we don't have to have it, we, we that would be the the ideal. Were any of those areas looked at when you're giving us this million four eighty nine? Or I'm just asking. Because you don't know until you unhook it, right? Well, so to speak. Well, some of the stuff you don't know until you actually physically go in there and start taking stuff apart and turning the valves off to try to control the water flow, okay. so you can take the units out or change out the valves. I just have one, couple of small questions, N nothing crazy. Uh, how long? How long will this HVAC system last in this? Get a estimate, buddy, for how long you think this work will 20 take years. this building through? The type of equipment that's being installed is typically has a life of 20 plus years. Perfect. I won't be here when, it's, when it goes down. Uh, you might be. No, I won't be. God's going to take me soon, believe me. Um, the chiller that's outside probably has a life of 15 years. 15 years. Excellent. Remember how long your dad was. Now. That's true. That's true. Uh, one last question. Um, Make sure here. Um, I guess before I would like to make the decision if you take ARP funds or a general um, fund balance is um, how much is in the general fund balance, first and foremost. Don't have to give it to me now, but that would be my question. Sure. Uh, how much is in a general fund balance and how much do we have currently in our ARP fund balance? I know we've taken some off the table there a couple of months ago. I just want to make sure that I have those those account balances uh, up to date, so to speak. So for ARP, uh, our original uh, allocation was $32,925,136. Uh, 
the commissioners have approved at this point to spend one million twenty five thousand seven hundred sixty four dollars for um, there's two mental health agencies various pieces of equipment and three new positions in county government then uh, the commissioners have also approved to spend ARP funding at the, the amount three million eight hundred forty two thousand nine hundred eighty one dollars that was to cover ARP eligible costs March through June of 21 um, so and it, uh, the commissioners we talked about using art funds for the uh, licensed clinical social worker but we have gone with lap salary for the LSCW so the current art funds remaining is twenty eight million fifty six thousand three hundred ninety one dollars uh, so with the we're, we're this item proposes to take the funding for this project from the capital reserve for the county so uh, we have currently budgeted one million dollars in paygo that was for medicap so that money is already budgeted but it's coming from capital reserve not our not our um, fund balance I, I, it's a part of fund balance but specifically for capital reserve and our total unallocated uh capital reserve for county government capital reserve not fund balance uh, i believe the last time we ran the davenport plan was about 1.7 million dollars so if you had to use the entire 700,000, our uh, unallocated capital reserve not fund balance just capital reserve would be about a million but that needs to be rerun because we've deferred some debt so I think that's going to be more than than that um, we are actually working on uh, what our fund balance looks like post 20 would be 2021 I know uh, Andrew and Susan are working with the auditors now we're wrapping up our audit I think what I can say tonight is that we are going to add to unassigned fund balance right. from 21 22 uh, I'd be a little reluctant to quote the figure tonight, Absolutely. but between um, sales tax dollars that came in so strong, property tax dollars that came in higher, and then some of these um, other funds that we've received, we will add to unassigned fund balance. I believe it would be safe to say we will add to unassigned fund balance in an amount significantly, significantly greater than this project cost. So. You know, tonight we're talking about just keeping this in the capital fund, but if the commissioners ever decided they wanted to use unassigned fund balance rather than uh, the, the um, capital reserve, you could certainly do that. I think we've kind of conditioned ourselves to live in that um, capital reserve fund. So I, I do think this is a good project for ARP, but I, uh, you know, I do um, know that there's concern about making sure we have a plan for how to spend that. And I think I told the commissioners, I can't remember if we met, talked about this last time, but our plan is to come to you on October 4th with the comprehensive list of everything we know of at this point that has come in from either county government, uh, some of the stakeholder groups that we work with out in the community or from commissioners themselves and do a presentation to you that will hopefully set the table to say, we've got 28 million in ARP left plus 3.8 in pandemic. And here's the list of things that we have seen uh, come into county government requesting to spend ARP funds on. One thing to note, and I will say, is we've been told we were hoping to get ARP final guidance either this month or the 1st of October. I don't believe that's going to be the case. We were told, end of, I think it was the end of last week, that uh, the, this fall we will know that. So we feel like, you know, we have, we have projects that are currently ARP eligible per interim guidance. So we're going to demonstrate all this to you on the 4th, and then you can, you can make decisions about do any of them strike you fancy and you want to proceed with them. Do you want to, uh, we talked about committees. Do you want to uh, have committees involved? How do you want to handle the spending? But um, I, hope that, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank and you, you also, Hager. I remember the 338 three, that you're going kind of back to get that will come back to us, and that won't have to be spent as ARP. We can go in our general fund, right? That, that, that if, if that happens, because every month you don't know. <laughs> this, the, the 3.8 that the commissioners uh, voted to spend of ARP money on eligible expenses from March through June of 21, we, we put it in a uh, in pandemic designated fund. So it is in a designated fund right now, separate from unassigned fund balance. So you can see it. We won't spend any of that 3.8 million without coming to the commissioners about it. Um, and you, when you see the list of items that are for ARP uh, consideration, some you will see are not eligible for ARP. So you may want to think about, do you want to use any of that 3.8 for that? You don't have to. You could put it back in unassigned fund balance or do a myriad of things with it. I mean, you could really do almost anything with the 3.8 that you'd like to do. I think we're keeping it in pandemic uh, just to, because it came from ARP spending. We want to make sure, yes, we want to make sure you have the, you have the transparent information of what you want to do with, the, with those dollars too. 
Any other questions? If you take this from capital reserve, <laughs> we could basically do the same thing with the art money later and recover that. Is that correct? Uh, yes. If you if you vote tonight to do capital reserve, we'll have it on the list for your consideration on October fourth, also because it is an eligible expense, right? We want to take advantage of the the pricing that we have now and proceed with this this evening, if possible. But we'll we'll have it. You'll see it again October fourth, unless you say you're going to do it with ARP tonight. If you vote tonight, do capital reserve. We'll put it on the ARP list, and you may October fourth do that or any time subsequent. I'm not sure if there's a time limit other than the three-year time limit to spend the dollars. There may right. be some time limits about going backwards. Uh, so we wouldn't want to wait too long sure. to make that decision. But Do we have to pick any funding source tonight? I think for us to be able to proceed uh, with awarding the bid and, right. and budgeting the funding so we can we can uh, award the bid, we, we need to select something tonight. So we're, we're recommending capital reserve tonight. Just wanted you to know it is ARP eligible. And if you, if you want to do that, you can do it tonight or you can do it on the 4th or I wouldn't. I probably shouldn't say any time thereafter. There, there comes a point where it'd be best to to, to make that call. Absolutely. Any other questions, Mr. Paisley? No, sir. Um, I would encourage us to take the capital reserves at this point and then look at it again in October as to the art money. Why? Why? Mr. Yes, sir. It gives us a lot of flexibility, and we can. Uh, we have put flexibility it in. in our. We have flexibility in our, uh, in our general fund, and and uh, we have we have the flexibility there. And I think if we go, if we use the ARP money, we're using the federal money first before we're using our Alamance County taxpayer dollars. That's, that's where I come down on that. Uh, that money that you're talking about will be there in 30 days and 45 days, for us to actually use on something else. That's my right. personal opinion. But the art money will not be if we go ahead and ex expend that now. Well, art money is going to have to go away at some point in time, based solely on time that the federal government's given us. So we should probably use that money that has the uh, short time frame, rather than our tax dollars that has a little bit longer time frame because of the ARP money. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Vice Chairman, I, I, I'd like to at least start with a motion that we. Uh, that we approve uh, budget. Yeah. Probably, uh, I'm looking for bid. the name of the entity. Uh, Superior Mechanic Mechanical Services bid for the HVAC uh, replacement project for HSC, uh, totaling 1.48 plus the uh, 1.498 million plus the 15 percent contingency. We have a second. I'll second it, but I have a question. Okay. For my and motion and a second, any discussion? Any I like question? to have a discussion. <laughs> uh, I think this is this is actually needs to be done, and I totally agree. The time very time sensitive. Uh, I guess my biggest question to um, the gentleman in the back is, uh, and to Mr. Haygood, you know, this as we were talking before, this has been a two or three year project you know, to get this thing done. Are there any other buildings in the county system that has that two to three year time frame in which we may have to have to deal with this again? Uh, the reason I ask that is because um, it, since we, I don't know this to be true, but uh, if I got my way and able to use ARP funds with this, if we could look in our system and see if there's another building that's two or three years from uh, going down on us, that maybe we could uh, look forward and maybe go ahead and schedule that particular building to right. get taken care of, and we could use our current ARP funding source to take care of that as we look down the road in that two or three year, that three year window. That's all I think I'm looking that's for. That's an excellent point. I think I would say, buddy, correct me if I'm wrong. HSC probably has the worst condition of HVAC in our building inventory that has that many employees in it. it, it, it yes, it's, so this is the worst that we have right now that's occupied with employees from an HVAC perspective. What you will see on the fourth is a list of uh, capital projects, right? So we have other capital projects in our capital plan that uh, we're going to present to you to consider ARP funding for now. It's difficult for us right now to tell you exactly how much ARP funding. Uh, a good example would be the proposed um, 
uh, J.B. Allen renovation, right? I think that was a two, two and a half million dollar proposal. Some of that is going to be some HVAC work if they're just moving around spaces. It's going to have to redo duct work, and uh, part of that's going to be for safe distancing too. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for us to tell you what exact dollar amount, but what we'll try to do is give you an idea of what you may want to consider earmarking of ARP until we get into that project so you'll have it to say okay this project won't cost two and a half million ARP will pay for you know seven eight hundred thousand dollars of it let's use the ARP money because it's on the horizon to be done uh, hopefully within the ARP time frame there are uh, I was trying to think if there were other just off the top of my head HVAC related or ARP related projects in the capital plan do you remember Andrea we do have a handful of projects some of them are on our unfunded list some of them were scheduled to be done two or three years down the road because of our annual CIP wouldn't cover it. So those projects have been all included on the list. Their prioritization, um, we're going to put them on the list because they're, they may have ARP eligible features and then the priority of when they need to be done would need to be revisited. And I think the, the, the other piece that we're really waiting for is that final guidance because we keep hearing that it's possible that Treasury is going to expand what you can do with capital. So if we have a project like, um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of a good, particularly our CECOM stuff, you know, we, we would like, uh, we have a project in the capital plan to build two more Viper Towers in Alamance County. If, if Treasury gives freedom to use this money for capital like that, because we've talked about the possibility of hooking that into a broadband type distribution point wherever it's installed if that strikes the commissioner's fancy and you think that's a valuable project and you want to make sure there's money to do that the board may want to earmark not expend at that moment but to say out of the remaining 28 million we want to earmark 2 million for this project if it comes if final guidance comes out whenever it does and it's eligible we would let you know and you may want to spend it if it's not if it comes out and it's not it goes back in the pot and you, you repurpose it for something else do we not have to vote on this in two separate votes? That is, yes. one to um, implement the contract itself. That's and correct. The, second, the budgetary. I think it needs to be two separate votes. That's correct. Yes, sir. The uh, the the item you're you're considering now, uh, and I believe there's a motion and, and second for is awarding the bid. Uh, as as indicated to Superior Mechanical, and then the very next item will be the, the funding for that. So I hope that answers you. your question, yes, sir. sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Turner, I think you need to amend your motion. No, my motion was just for uh, to approve the um, the bid. The contract itself. Yes. All right. Thank you. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second, and no discussion. Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Unanimous. Okay. Now we go on to the budget amendment. So Andrew, if you could speak to if you could speak to the uh, the budget, please. I think you have pretty much shared everything that we could think of. Um, the budget amendment that is presented in your information was assuming that the option, <coughs> the first option for consideration, would be to work within our existing funding, uh, work within our existing capital plan. What it would do is uh, budget $1,712,350 for this project in a capital project fund. We would be using a million dollars that was in our general fund intended for other projects that we don't need it, uh, don't need those funds for that project anymore. So that million dollars would fund the, a portion of the capital project and then we'd pull $712,350 from the capital reserves and use that for the capital project as well. So the, the budget amendment was set up to do that. And uh, if the board preferred to use ARP, uh, we would just ask that uh, you give us that direction. The budget amendment would be done uh, back in the office. It's uh, not something that the format of it is, is not nearly as complicated. It's just moving money from one line item to another in the ARP uh, fund. So if you didn't have or you'd be able to pay for it this way. Correct. Yes, we have we have enough capital reserves to pay for it with capital reserves or or with all. I just want to say something about this R. I don't. I just want us to be really, really open-minded about everybody in the community that does services for people in the community, and we don't build a bunch of buildings with this money <coughs> you've got 
people who work face to face with stuff that could really use some help as well. That's all because I'm hearing towers and I mean, you know, I, it never, I don't understand how money for a disease is okay to build a tower. <laughs> But that's just me. I'm not like you guys way over the top when it comes to that kind of smart stuff. But it, I just don't want us to. Um, uh. I think the biggest thing that I'm pushing to use ARP funds for this particular project is because I think that the HVAC has mm -hmm. been, uh, you know, as far as the our system is concerned and the inside of it, it will help our employees, uh, county employees that work there. And I think going forward, as, that's why I asked the question about do we have any projects in the next two or three years that these HVAC systems will, you know, I guess the way they've been, the way I've been looking at them on, online is that there are more infiltration systems that are being added to these things to help facilitate that, that air quality that I know that the federal government's going to come down on at some point. I know they haven't made it, but it's coming. I uh, just hear, too, hear them talk about it too much. Well, I agree. It's like with schools. Look how much money they're going to spend on their HVACs, and you think, God, if they're this important to spend on it, why well, haven't they been that important mm -hmm. to spend on it? I, I agree. mean, that's been a long story history of that. But, um, well, if we use our funds, too, that gives us our money that we can use for things that aren't yeah. Park control. Something that comes down the pipe that we need this money for, we can allocate it that way. And that's the allocation of scarce resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Budget hard funds now? Yes, sir. Okay. What, one question is if, if final guidance for some reason restricts this, we're not anticipating that, but, but if final guidance won't allow this expenditure, what do we do then? If, if we approve our funding, final guidance won't allow it, what do we do then? I think we've got. I would Capital say we, reserve, would, we right? would first argue with Treasury about the fact that we, if we did this, we did it under interim guidance, and they're encouraging folks to do projects under interim guidance. But uh, if, if we lost that argument, then we'd look at capital reserves uh, to go back and pay for it. Because okay. all of these expenditures will be audited pretty, pretty tightly, so it's possible they could come back and any of these that we've approved thus far say, no, you can't do that, or you can't do that part of that. That's probably more likely to say yeah. that particular piece of that project you can't do with ARP. So, you know, then we would be sitting down saying, okay, let's go capital reserve for that dollar amount. Um, I think that would wind up coming back to the commissioners for a budget amendment of some type to mm -hmm. switch the funding sources. We right. may not know that for a couple of years. When right. do we actually have to pay any money on this contract? Uh, once the work gets started, they'll be able to make crop monthly draws on the work. We've we got, what is it, 300 day? lead time to do this project because it's in phases okay. and you get the equipment in and this first phase is going to be actually the first floor of the same day circuit of Wayne where they're doing the code shots and all but that's something we'll have to work out with Tony on scheduling if they're still in the big rush on shots and stuff he might not be able to shut down and be able to do this work at that time so we'll have to just schedule the phases it depends on how the equipment works out coming in and what we can actually work on at the time due to COVID. So may I make two points? So what we have heard last week is that the U.S. Treasury is going to honor interim guidance. Any activities or any decisions that are made under interim guidance will be honored as long as you're within your, your, uh, your project meets the terms of interim guidance, they'll honor that even if they change their minds with final guidance. Okay. So there will be will be grandfathered in until the final guidance is issued. The other thing is that for good or bad, the commissioners can choose to change your mind at every single meeting. Uh, you can choose ARP today and next week reverse it and do something different. So it's just a budget amendment from staff viewpoint. So there's nothing really irrevocable, even if you have spent money using a particular budgetary source. The only thing that we ask is that when the auditors come back around next year, that we can tell them which what, what the final decision was. So we need to vote on that. And you know what, Mr. Turner, I think the probability of us getting shut down on this particular is, is, is probably less than 1%, yeah. if I had to. 
there. Right? Yeah, it's just because it fits everything that they're throwing down the pipe. Well, that's one of the first things they addressed when they put the money out in the first place was HVAC. Yeah. The HVAC well, federal government system. has tendency to be a little moody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's okay. true. Um, do we have a motion? I thought we. We already, we already Wait a minute. For, we already voted we, for the first one. This is the, this second is on how to pay how okay. to budget. Okay. Okay. Do we have a motion? I'd make a motion that we use the ARP funds to finance this project. We have a second. I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Mr. Paisley? Yes, aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Baker, I think you're up next. Good evening. I will take as long <laughs> as that last one. <laughs> oh, quick well, budget amendment. I have a challenge with, with the chairman that we're going to keep this meeting under two hours. I'll okay. do. I'll do my Get part. Close. I'll do my part. It's probably my fault tonight. Still <laughs> don't 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 hold me to that, Thomas. Uh, I'm seeking a budget amendment. We're um, looking for permission to apply for, for two grants, and the grants were, are for, for $150,000, so 150000 total, uh, to continue our development at Cane Creek Mountain Natural Area. So the two grant sources are um, one from the North, State of North Carolina's Recreational Trails Program grant, money they specifically set aside for this purpose, to build trails uh, open to the public. Um, that one is $100,000. The $50,000 grant is from Impact Alamance. Um, they routinely uh, support our efforts to um, build uh, structures and built environment to help people get outside and be healthy. Um, so these will both go to continuing uh, to open new sections of the park to the public. Phase one um, is complete. Phase two is happening right now. Um, these will help us finish phase two, building trails, and help us start on what will be phase three, which is more trails and another trailhead um, to build our capacity. What we have built there so far um, is enough, but barely. Um, as we get towards fall, it gets very popular and very, mm -hmm. very crowded. So we weren't sure we're doing this in phases because you know we don't know how many people are gonna come. It's a bit of a guess. Um, we definitely need to do phase two and, and I think phase three at this point. So it's getting very popular. Ryan, who yeah. wrote this grant? Anna Boland, our grants and communications coordinator. You know, maybe you should hire her to write the grants. She is not eligible to do county work now or ever. Everybody <laughs> He said now or ever. Uh, she, she actually, oh she, I, I'd, I'd love to share her. It's just not gonna, it's not possible. Um, no, she's very good. Does a great job with all of our grants. Okay, do we have a motion to approve? I'll make it. I'll second it. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Call her, Mr. Haygood. Yeah. <laughs> Do it after hours. Right. Yes. Public speakers. Well, the good news, Ms. Yarborough, is this is not as late as you could have been. <laughs> That's based true. on recent history. So uh, I think you have a comment you would like to make to us tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much, commissioners. Uh, good evening. And uh, I know I have my three minutes. So what I'm going to say to you quickly is, uh, and I'm here representing the Board of Elections. I'm the chair of the Board of Elections. And what I want to ask you is where am I going? Where are we going after November the 30th? Uh, where, where do we go? Uh, you know we move from one election right into the other election. And I, because time is of the essence and I know I only have like three minutes, what we have asked is that we are on your, the agenda for the October 4th meeting. We will make a presentation to you. I have spoken uh, with uh, Chairman Paisley uh, at length. Uh, after which he gave me a three and a half minute joke uh, after we had our long discussion uh, about this 
And so what we're asking is that if you have questions of us, <coughs> please forward them to the executive director, uh, Kathy Holland. We will prepare a pack for you. But I am going to share quickly, uh, just a couple of seconds here, uh, about the times we've had to move voting equipment, uh, election supplies, how we've had to secure election supplies. And I'm telling you, we've been moving since 1993. And uh, we were in uh, 2003, we're in the basement of the county annex building. Uh, in 2004, we were at the jail annex, which is the gated and housed uh, community for federal prisoners. Uh, in 2005, we were at the current Board of Elections building uh, where we had our voting equipment. At that time, we used uh, microvote, which was just uh, small computers. Then we had to, uh, which weighed just a few pounds. Uh, then in 2006, we went to the Ivotronic equipment, which weighed 55 pounds, and we had like 365 of those. So you can tell. Uh, using uh, small computers like this versus something that weighs uh, 55 pounds and we had 365 of those and we had to squeeze them in the building uh, where we currently are. We really uh, need space. We didn't just start working on that uh, this year. We've been trying to find space for uh, several years now because we have been moving from 1993, <clears throat> excuse me, up until uh, till now. Uh, we, um, for our supplies, we were at the basement of the county annex building uh, um, uh, in 2008. We were at the dog pound. Uh, and let me tell you, when it rained, um, all of the dust and water got in on our supplies and equipment. Uh, we um, then around 2014, we had to, for our supplies, we had to store them in the small 8x8 eight eight room at the Board of Elections. We barely have enough room for staff uh, where we are now. And you also know that that building has a plumbing and sewage problem. It needs to be torn down as well. Uh, we also uh, uh, leased um, MedCap B and MedCap C. I believe you've taken our money. Uh, 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 so, <laughs> and, uh, didn't, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he's taking our money, but he's on our side. Uh, so we're asking you to help us find, but we want to present to you so that you will know, uh, give you a full um, explanation or show you exactly uh, what, um, you know, what we're going to need. Uh, <clears throat> we did move some equipment uh, to the... Um, Ralph, uh, Ralph Scott building. Uh, we had to put that on hold because of COVID because at, you remember at that time the sheriff needed it to quarantine prisoners. And so we had to put part of that on hold. So we are now uh, at the Med, uh, MedCap building and we are going to have to leave that. Now we were hoping that we would have been able to purchase that, uh, but someone got it uh, be before we did. Even though, again, we have been uh, uh, asking for uh, uh, space. And then we did um, rent some space from American Self Storage. You will have a more detailed report uh, on October 4th. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know, put this on your radar screen so that you know we are asked and we have asked uh, Commissioner Paisley to put us on the agenda for October 4th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yarbrough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and we are going to be in a position where I think that uh, we got a report last meeting that that building lease will be extended to November 30th, I think that was correct. Yes, uh, so we've executed that, and um, I know Sherry and Joel are working with Kathy now to figure out uh, where, where we stage their gear post-election until we can have a more concrete plan about uh, space for the Board of Elections. Do we know, I know we've talked about this before, I'm just trying to get you to refresh my memory, how much square footage does the Board of Elections need to, 
to facilitate everything they're looking for? That's a good question. I think we had about 12,000 square feet, Sherry. Is that, is that roughly correct? 11,000 to 12,000 is what we're And it needs at. to be sort of a climate control issue as yes. well? Okay. And, you know, I think the, we'll speak out of turn here, but I think the ultimate goal would be for the, the staff offices and all storage to be in one place. That would be ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you have some storage needs and then there's office and meeting room space so the board could meet there too, so. Uh, just to go, just extrapolate a little further, you need this square footage to be centered in Graham. Well, I think, uh, you know, we've made use of Medicap, which is right on the line. Sure. There's not, if I remember correctly, there was no legislation that requires the Board of Election to be located in the city of Graham. Uh, you know, it's, it's tradition, it's, yeah. it's history, but uh, it could be, it would, I would suggest to the commissioners that centrally located urban core as close to the center of the county somewhere would probably be best. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just to just a note, obviously, um, Ms. Yarbrough went a little bit over her three minutes, but she wasn't making personal comments. She was no. talking about an agency. Yeah, we appreciate, so appreciate your time. She was Absolutely. We appreciate your time. Appreciate your time, definitely. Absolutely. Um, you need to be in the moving business. <laughs> <laughs> you got that down. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chair. Yes. Okay, I uh, you know, served on the Board of Regents for many, many, many years. Chair of that board for many years and so forth. They've always had a tremendous need for space um, and a place of their own, so to speak. Um, and I did talk to Ms. Yarborough for probably half an hour talking about different options and things of that sort. I'll apologize in advance for having told a three and a half minute joke. <laughs> <laughs> It was a ball hook joke. <laughs> John, that was a short one for you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll assure you, I'll not tell another joke. So, uh, and, and, uh, right uh, down. Yeah, I would ask that the uh, administration, the staff, particularly of uh, both um, our our staff, uh, Mr. Haygood and so forth, Miss Hook, uh, and the Board of Elections, to come back with some ideas on our October for our October fourth meeting as to locations and uh, possibilities and more specifics as to requirements. Uh, I totally agree with, with this Yarborough that uh, everything needs to be in one location. I like the idea of everything being in the county seat as opposed to having part of our uh, county all spread all, all over the county. That's just not a really smart idea. Uh, we're adding on to our current courthouse, and that's in the process of uh, moving very rapidly. Um, we ought to include this, the Board of Elections, as part of that uh, uh, future planning. Well, I agree with you, uh, John, that, that they've been moved around an awful lot. It's about time, and with us COVID money, we ought to be able to find some money to find a permanent home for Board of Elections after all this time. Um, um. Certainly. Okay. We're talking about even with the addition of the J.B. Allen building, uh, how many floors and the type structure, um, and it could conceivably be, um, yeah, have an additional floor for the Board of Elections even. Obviously, you're gonna have to have an elevator in it, so it's not gonna be one of those that um, yeah, would be a handicap issue um, because it's going to have to be accessible anyway. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any other commissioner comments or responses? County manager's report. Uh, the only item I have, commissioners, if you recall, we tabled an appointment to the um, JCPC committee for ABSS at our last meeting. Uh, we will revisit that, but it, it will be at a subsequent meeting. It's okay. not on this agenda and uh, it will be later before that is addressed. Okay. Monthly fiscal report. Just for the board and the public's knowledge, it is included. You can uh, just see how, I think we've shared this with the commissioners, how our, um, particularly our sales tax and property tax revenues are performing. And there's information in this report also about uh, the school system and the community college too, so. Good information in there. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Definitely. Any other commissioner comments? Is there a line on I there? Have, 
one single comment. That is, we have three minutes until your two-hour barrier, and I really don't want to say that I move that we adjourn, but I'll do it to save your two-hour comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, well, sir. <laughs> I've got a question that'll take less than 30 seconds and an answer that'll take less than two. Okay. So, Mr. Aget, is there a line item in the, in the information you presented about the ABSS's capital reserve and how um, how much over budgeted, how much over budget they are in the capital reserve area? So, the, based on actual revenue from last year. The most recent capital report, I believe, is included in this information that went to the commissioners. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that? I know it's posted on the website. I believe the last version I saw was August 20th. I'm not sure if that version of the report includes the 2021 restricted sales tax that came in above budget or not. So we're still refining with interest income and other things okay. to get the precise number. That report will be available for the next TRC meeting. In fact, I don't believe it is in this. It, the August 20th version is available at alamancecapitalprojects.com. You can see it there. And we, as we update them on a monthly basis, we post them there. So, uh, Will we have that information available at the next county commissioner's meeting? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. And that'll be a final number for last year? Uh, an unaudited final number, but uh, about as close as we can get. Audits, reserve the right to say the audit may change that number. Sure. Somewhat. When will the audit occur? November? Um, so we have had our interim and our financial review. So we are now in the process of finalizing. Gotcha. So it'll be within so the next 30 days. So we should get it um, probably longer than that mm -hmm. um, due to the ARC funding. Yes. And right now our auditors do not have a compliance supplement on how they, what audit procedures they need to perform on those funds. Um, so we are estimating that it would probably be closer to December before we were to receive a final report. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Any other comments? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.